Yeah, no, thank you so much for having me here to talk to you. Um, you know, this is an absolute delight. Prioritization, I mean, that's what it's all about because everybody wants everything right now for no money, right? I mean, that's, mm -hmm. that's kind of it. So, you know, when you have organizations that have different teams and different priorities, but, you know, also competing for budget for different initiatives, then how do you actually rank what's going to happen now? Mm -hmm. So to me, that's really what it's about is looking at competing interests, um, limited budget, um, also having to educate an organization and its stakeholders around the longer term value. I think that's the catch, right? Is that you want to have these quick wins, but long term gains. So you know, where do you put your resources in terms of you know, human capital, in terms of you know, tech, you know, tech capabilities, in terms of budget at the end of the day? And you know, for an organization, for um, decision makers, especially up at the top, ultimately they want to see quick wins. They want to see something that's going to improve the balance sheets today because they're ultimately accountable to, you know, to their shareholders, um, to their investors, and so on and so forth. So you know, therein lies the challenge because what you're looking to do is to make a case for a longer term horizon of an investment against the competing priority of needing to have the short-term wins. Mm -hmm. What you really want is you want the business coming to you and saying, this is the outcome that we want. How are we going to get there? That's the ultimate situation, right? I think one of the challenges that we have at the moment, especially when we talk about technology, is that technology, when you look at the P&L, is put under the L, right? It's put under the sunk costs. Mm -hmm. But another team gets to reap the benefits, right? So, for example, you might put in a CRM and then, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, yep, the tech team, the tech team, they're spending all this money, they're spending, you know, all of our time getting all these workshops happening, et cetera, et cetera, to get this whole thing standing up. Mm -hmm. And then six months later, you have the sales team going, yep, yep, you know, we've improved our performance, we've, you know, we have slimmer margins because we're, you know, you know we've actually been able to, um, you know, cut the human capital costs, we're improving our performance, etc. So it becomes this little bit of an imbalance, right? Because the tech team is seen as costs, whereas other teams are reaping the benefits. So, you know, if we can think about, you know, two things, rebalancing the conversation that tech gets the, um, the recognition for the wins, mm -hmm. I think is one thing. But secondly, also tying tech initiatives into the organizational goals to say, if the organization wants to do X, Y, and Z, this is how we can help you get there. I think that's the million dollar question at the moment. Um, actually, to call it a million dollar question is probably undervaluing it <laughs> quite, quite a lot, right? <laughs> With, you know, I'd, I'd challenge the thinking of, you know, a home office third place. Mm -hmm. And you know, I talk about this concept of the any place workplace that wherever you have connectivity, you're working, whether you're on the bus and sitting on your phone, if you're sitting at Starbucks, if you're sitting in the library, it, it doesn't matter anymore. You know, it's a matter of where can we connect, how can we connect in? So, you know, the future of work, the future of, you know, connection of company culture is something that we're still yet to see. But I think another statistic that I found to be quite interesting is we're not just talking about return to office or slow return to office and this desire for um, flexible working in, you know, in you know, societies like ours, like, you know, Australia or, you know, the UK or the US, you know, there's a very slow return to office. And you know, for me as a real estate person, that's something that's quite, um, you know, confrontational. But I think one of the um, stats that I delved into in a little bit more detail recently, which I found to be quite fascinating, was around the great resignation mm. and people wanting to you know, leave their roles to the great unknown, which we know the figures are you know, massive. And you know, you can, any, any um, poll might say between 30% or 60%, right? But what I found quite interesting in that one is that the largest contingent that wanted to leave their roles was actually in India. Oh, okay. Okay, so now we're thinking of it, and it's about why was that? You know, mm -hmm. why was that? And it's a lack of upward mobility. Mm -hmm. 
So if we think about, you know, India's role at the moment, you know, great tech talent, call centers, so on and so forth. If we have, if we lose 40% of that workforce because they're dissatisfied, we're actually not talking about offices and spaces. We've got to look at, well, you know, how do we retain that talent mm -hmm. wanting to do the types of roles that they do? You know, how can we give them a higher and better purpose and upward mobility to be able to do that? So, you know, I think when we're talking about, you know, hybrid work, remote work, when we're talking about return to office, future workplace, etc., we do need to kind of cut it down. We do need to segment it by location, you know, demographics, role type, personality type, introverts, extroverts, etc., 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 because mm -hmm. these demo, you know, these stats are too broad. But I think at every single point, when you go to like one level down, like my example of, you know, it's, it's talent in India, it actually opens up a whole new picture.